Good afternoon, everyone. I see that we have a rather large group and that reflects the fact that 18 months after the initial knockdown, there's still a lot of interest in the pandemic, unfortunately. I welcome you all. My name is Mitchell Cronenberg and I'm the chief scientific officer here at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. And I'll be the moderator today for our speaker, Dr. Erica Ullman Sapphire. I'd like to begin just by uh, giving you a few words about the La Jolla Institute for Immunology, where I've worked for 24 years and where I was president for 18 years until very recently. Uh, <clears throat> so we are a leading immunology focused independent research institute. We're a bit different from a university. Our main focus is to generate new knowledge that will help human health. And we are an immunology focused organization because we know that studies in the immune system provide the greatest opportunity for improving human health. <clears throat> Turns out that many diseases are caused by or and or can be prevented by influencing the immune system. And the list of diseases influenced by the immune system has grown in recent years, in part due to our research and research from others. And therefore, in order to communicate this to the public, we've organized our research into three centers, the Center for Autoimmunity and Inflammation, the Center for Infectious Disease and Vaccine Research, and the Center for Cancer Immunotherapy. And if you look at the list of research areas or diseases that our research is related to on the right, you can see that it covers the gamut from uh, autoimmunity inflammation, such as uh, Alzheimer's and asthma, to uh, dis infectious disease, on to cancer immunotherapy. <clears throat> Few facts about the Institute. We were founded in 1988. We have almost 500 employees, over 200 uh, individuals with doctoral degrees, we call them postdoctoral fellows from all around the world, and 20 uh, lab heads or principal investigators who choose their own topic and are world leaders in their fields. And we have uh, won recently the X Prize for a COVID test that was developed in-house. Uh, it was a contest to develop a test that was relatively inexpensive and could be potentially commercialized. And I should point out that we won of five winners out of more than 740 uh, contestants. And our research has enormous impact in terms of the number of citations that we receive. But a very important part of the Institute to me and to all who work here is our culture. And I'm proud that we have been repeatedly named one of the top workplaces in San Diego. And prior to that, even in academia, and that's true not only for the years shown, but for 2021. No research institute, no research enterprise can, can take place without adequate funding. And our current funding comes from a variety of sources, but the majority from federal grants and contracts, but also from affiliates and philanthropy plays an important role. And I know many of you may have seen similar slides previously in presentations I've made. Uh, that number of 81.6 is an all time high and is in fact grown dramatically in part through recent philanthropic gifts, which are very important for us. <clears throat> so our impact can be measured in different ways. So one is the publications that we have that are read and cited around the world. That's what gave us that number five ranking. Another is commercialization. And as you can see, we have many uh, uh, patents. Uh, we have many agreements with uh, drug companies for corporate sponsored research or license agreements. And importantly, uh, findings from this institute are in various kinds of clinical trials, including one that's I would describe as uh, ready for stage three, a stage three asset, if you will. Another way to measure our impact is not only uh, what scientists are reading, and, uh, and that's very important. Uh, so we have six highly cited researchers, which are ranked in the top 1% out of a, a rather small faculty group of, of uh, only 20 individuals. Uh, Dr. Fauci has uh, referenced our work repeatedly, as have some members of Congress 
And they sometimes take different interpretations of what the work means. But that aside, uh, our work has been uh, so much in the forefront uh, with regard to the pandemic that we've been mentioned. Uh, one of our professors, Shane Crotty, has uh, um, created some educational videos on COVID-19 with literally millions of views. And our research and our uh, has been covered in the leading uh, outlets, as you can see here, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Atlantic, CNN, uh, mainstream media, and other media as well. And our scientists have given over 500 interviews during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the, uh, the pandemic, uh, as on all of your lives, has had a tremendous impact on what's going on at this organization. So this impact is fueled uh, by a number of factors. One is that we have developed a national and international data sets that we have generated and analyzed and have uh, been widely used. One is the new nepotope database, the other is DICE. This top one is about um, what molecular fragments the immune system recognizes. And this one is about how your individual genetics influences your immune response to, our, uh, to your tendency to develop autoimmunity or perhaps your tendency to uh, respond differently to a vaccine. Uh, also, uh, like scientists everywhere, we have worldwide collaborations, the Viral Immunotherapeutic Consortium and the Coronavirus Immunotherapy Consortium, or COVIC, and I'll mention these again briefly, as well as uh, MESA-wide, in other words, Torrey Pines area, collaborations for immunotherapy uh, and, and collaborations with the university, of course. And a third thing that's very critical for us is our enduring partnerships. One is with a uh, Japanese pharmaceutical company, Kyohako Kirin. Uh, it's the longest standing industry academia partnership, which has generated uh, much important funding for our investigators through discretionary and directed funding from the company. And for the company has generated uh, assets that are now in clinical trials. And a second and a most important collaborator is the UC San Diego Health System and UC San Diego, with whom we have very close relationships uh, and in fact, we're on the east side of their campus. And then there are others in uh, regenerative, sorry, in regenerative medicine and in vaccine development. Okay, so that gives you an idea about how a, a fairly uh, a moderately sized organization can have such uh, large impact. So our speaker today in today's, uh, in today's uh, presentation will be Erica Ullman Sapphire and Erica, recently became the, uh, uh, the president of the Institute, my successor. Uh, and she is a leading investigator uh, in viral immunology and structural biology. And her, her original flow of work was on the uh, hemorrhagic viruses. And, and, uh, and she had tremendous impact there and organized the consortium, the Viral Immunotherapeutic Consortium, for people around the world to cooperate to identify, develop, and uh, use uh, therapeutic monoclonal antibodies. When COVID-19 came along, she directed her research in that direction. And due to funding from the NIH and also from the Gates Foundation, she put together COVID, a coronavirus uh, a, a consortium, again, for testing uh, and analyzing therapeutic antibodies. So the Coronavirus Therapeutic Consortium, sorry. Uh, so she's a very accomplished scientist. She's a person who um, is uh, very adept at organizing investigators to work together, which isn't always an easy thing to do. And she's an advisor to multiple panels from NIH and from the World Health Organization. She's a wonderful uh, colleague for all of us here at the Institute and uh, has really taken off in her new leadership role as well. So. Uh, I've taken enough of your time, I'm sure. Erica, please tell us more about the current state of affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. So although I am now president of the Institute and it is such an honor to keep working with Mitch as our chief scientific officer, what I'm gonna tell you about today is the research in my lab, which goes on right through that door. And what I wanna tell you about is the program that we mobilized when coronavirus emerged. So about one year ago now, we, working with Los Alamos National Lab, published the first paper that noted a single point mutation had emerged in SARS-CoV-2 and within a month had become dominant around the globe. 
And that was very much a wake up call that this virus, although it has some proofreading capacity, could mutate these, muta these mutations change the virus's behavior. Since we published that paper a year ago, as you're all well aware from the news, there have been continual emergence of not just one single point mutation at one single space, but variants that are constellations of mutations, and a whole panoply of different things that have emerged from Pandora's box with the well over 200 million cases of coronavirus circulating around the world. The first on the scene was the alpha variant, originally identified in the United Kingdom. Beta, originally identified in South Africa, caused a lot of concern because it acquired mutations in the places to which early therapeutics were targeted. Gamma emerged in Japan and Brazil. Delta, this is the one of current concern. Epsilon and the new one, mu. The one that is very much part of the current conversation is Delta, because Delta has acquired some new capabilities that the original virus that emerged in late fall 2019 didn't have. So Delta, for example, appears to be about twice as contagious. It is more likely to make you ill if you do contract it. And it's faster. You test positive about four days after exposure instead of six. And there can be about a thousand times more viral RNA in your nose when you are infected. Now, the vi amount of viral RNA is not a perfect correlate to the amount of active virus. Some of that RNA can be debris. But it suggests that this thing is growing faster. It's also spreading faster. Now, I'm a pandemic virologist. I spent my career working on Ebola, Lassa, Marburg, paramyxoviruses, lots of viruses. Virologists use a term called r naught. That's R with a subscript zero. And this describes the extent to which a virus will propagate in a population. The original SARS-CoV-2 had an r naught of about two and a half. That meant that every infected person could infect about two and a half other unvaccinated people. Delta is a little different. Delta's R naught looks to be about three to four. Now that might not look like a big difference, half a person or one and a half more people, but the trouble is that viruses undergo exponential, exponential growth. And so what does that look like? Well, if you have the original virus and you have Delta, with the original virus that first came on the scene, that first infection might infect two and a half other people. Each of those would then infect another two and a half other people. And so by the second generation, you might have a little, few, a little more over six people infected. Whereas Delta, if we conservatively estimate as r naught is just one more, three and a half, as first generation, that person will infect three and a half others. Each of those will infect three and a half more. And by the second generation, Several weeks later, we have twice as many infected people. And in fact, if you propagate that exponential growth through a third generation, a fourth generation, and a fifth generation, by that fifth generation, which might just be two months later, you have five times as many people infected with Delta as with the original virus. And so this explains why Delta has spread widely and quickly, kind of racing our ability to vaccinate to control spread of the virus. When Delta first came on the scene, it was a minor population of the array of different viruses that would circulate. So if you look at early June, a lot of the virus circulating was the alpha variant, B.1.17. Delta was a minor population. But you can see how Delta starts to overtake alpha because it grows faster, spreads faster. By the end of June, it's the dominant one. By Labor Day, it's essentially the only virus circulating, and now greater than 99.4% of circulating viruses are Delta. The outbreak has changed to an outbreak Delta. So what does that mean? Well, we all got vaccinated with a molecule that resembled the original SARS-CoV-2. Delta is different. What is vaccine efficacy against Delta? So the challenge in understanding the real number here is that lots of different studies use different measures and in different populations, and different populations are differently vulnerable. Now, there's a real definition of what vaccine efficacy means. Vaccine efficacy, VE, is this formula. It is one minus the odds ratio of getting sick, having symptomatic disease, times the hazard ratio of winding up hospitalized from the infection. So there's a precise formula there. And the question, what is the vaccine efficacy against Delta? The answer is it's really pretty good, but it depends very much on the vaccine used, the population that's been studied, 
And what exactly is that the study is measuring? Some measure whether or not you've been infected at all. Other studies measure whether or not you've been sick. So for example, one of the first studies to come out was done by Public Health England, where they looked at 14,000 people who had been infected with Delta. Of those 14,000, 166 were hospitalized. And they could measure among people that received the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine that the vaccine was 80% effective in preventing any infection at all, whether you were symptomatic or asymptomatic, 88% effective in preventing you from getting sick, from having symptoms, symptomatic disease, 96% effective against being hospitalized. Now, the job of a vaccine really is to prevent illness and death. It is very difficult for a vaccine to prevent any infection at all, as we call sterile immunity. Because the job of a vaccine is really to look like a wanted poster, that it puts up a picture of the wanted criminal as your immune system knows what to expect and has that response ready. But typically, in order to mount that response later, that virus might have infected a couple of cells in your nose. And what your immune system is able to do is then launch and clear that infection before it's become systemic, before you've become sick or before you become very sick. It's a pretty tall order for any vaccine to prevent any infection at all. But these are actually working not that badly, and they're definitely doing their job against severe illness and hospitalization. The AstraZeneca vaccine looks to be less effective at preventing any disease at all, you know, the mild to moderate colds, but 93% effective against um, hospitalization with Delta. And if you're interested in Moderna, there have been a couple of studies on Moderna. So Kaiser Permanente ran a study in Southern California who looked at 330,000 cases of Delta. The CDC ran a different study looking at 33,000 cases of Delta, and all of the groups in both of these studies colored green received the Moderna vaccine. The Southern California study found that the Moderna vaccine was 87% effective against any infection at all, 96% effective against hospitalization. That CDC study across nine states found similar numbers, 95% effective against hospitalization, and they measured something different. They didn't measure infection, yes, no, at all, even asymptomatic. They measured whether that infection was severe enough to require urgent care visits or emergency visits. And so the take home message is that overall, those mRNA vaccines are pretty good. It looks to be about 80 to 85% effective against preventing any infection at all. They were about 91% effective against the original virus. So it's dimmed down a little bit, but they're doing their job. And the important thing is that they're 95 to 96% effective against hospitalization. But certainly age matters and it depends on the population. If you go and Google vaccine efficacy of Delta, you will come up with the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario is of a study done by the CDC of nursing home residents. So the most frail people they were living together in housing. So it's the most, the most frail population. And what they measured was any infection at all. They didn't, instead of reporting whether they were hospitalized or severely ill, they reported whether they had been infected at all. And so if you Google vaccine efficacy against Delta, the first hit that comes up says that the vaccines are 50% effective against Delta. And that's 50% effective in the most vulnerable and most failed populations against them being infected at all, even asymptomatically. So that's a very tall bar. And so it very much depends who you're measuring and what you're measuring. Certainly age matters. The mRNA vaccines are 95% efficacious against hospitalization in younger adults, about 80% effective in preventing hospitalization on older adults. But the thing about immunology is it's tremendously individual. In all of the neutralizing antibody studies that we've done in my lab for the last year and a half, the very highest neutralizing antibody titers that we have seen belonged to an 82 year old man. So it's individual. Some people mount very strong immune responses, others not. The other question people are wondering is, is our immunity waning? If one was vaccinated a long time ago, do we still have a lot of antibody left? Do we still have enough of a response left? And answering that question is a little bit challenging. When you draw blood, you measure what's called the plasma antibody, circulating antibody in your serum. That's not your only component of immunity. You also have the CD4 kind of T cells. You have the CD8 kind of T cells. You have other immune responses. In addition to circulating antibody, you have memory antibody. 
And so it is normal and expected that the level of circulating antibody against a, a pathogen you haven't seen in a long time would start to decline. Your immune system can't expend the calories to maintain an extraordinarily strong immune response against every single pathogen you've ever seen in your entire life. That's why you have a memory response. You have circulating antibody, and then your memory response will amplify in response to something you have seen before. We don't measure so much of that memory response when we take the serum. But the data we do have and whether or not immunity is waning is this. The Moderna results reported just in the last week, they analyzed 16,700 people that were vaccinated with their vaccine in the summer of 2020. Of those 16,700 people, 162 experienced breakthrough infections. So about just a little under 1% of the people. For people vaccinated about four or six months later, so between December of that year, and March of the next spring, of the 11,000 people vaccinated four to six months later, 88 had a breakthrough infection. So about 0.8% of people vaccinated a little later had a breakthrough infection. So there's small differences, but it's not nothing and it's something to consider. And so part of the conversation now is do we need a booster and who needs a booster? And so the questions that are part of the national conversation now is, if there are breakthrough infections, what can we do? Is there a safety net? Is there a treatment we can offer? There are certainly people that cannot be vaccinated for one reason or another, or have not yet been vaccinated, including most of the world. Most of the world has yet to receive even one shot of the vaccine. And there are cases of breakthrough infections. And if we experience emergence of new variants, we don't know what kinds of activities it will have. So is there a safety net? What can we do? And the second question is, it looks like we may be in for the long haul that emergence of novel coronaviruses will continue for quite some time. If we will need continued boosters in the future, do we have the right formulation? Do we have the ideal vaccine already or can we make it better? Maybe the first thing out of the starting gates isn't the best thing. So my laboratory has been engaged in answering those two questions for the last year and a half. And the first question, is there a safety net? What can you do if you're actually infected? And the answer is antibody. There are a lot of people who were, have not yet been vaccinated or they can't be vaccinated or have a compromised immune system. People in whom the vaccine didn't take, they didn't mount a sufficient immune response or an emerging variant has limited their vaccine efficacy. We can deliver antibody to them as a drug through an IV. A major goal of vaccines is to elicit those antibodies. Now, antibody is a molecule made by your immune system that's shaped like a Y. It's got two arms and a base. Those arms are what anchor onto pathogen. At the end of those arms, they have a combinatorial loops that make a fingerprint-like recognition for a particular place and a particular pathogen. And that base is what recruits your immune system to come in and destroy that pathogen and clear infected cells so they're no longer viral factories. Antibody is so effective at doing these jobs that you can gather antibodies either from survivors or infected people, and then you can choose the best to make them in the lab. You can actually deliver antibody as a drug to give somebody immunity immediately. So not four to six weeks later after a vaccine, but immediately in a crisis. So antibodies arise. After a person has been infected or vaccinated, several weeks later, their immune system starts to make these different proteins. And there's a whole array of ones that, uh, that you can make against different places and different pathogens. And they are remarkably precise. And there's a tremendous array. There are multiple clinical trials going on for different antibody therapeutics, including many of them in San Diego. And you can go to, go to different clinics in San Diego and get antibody therapies for no charge. And they've infused hundreds of patients now since last spring. There's a long history of using antibodies as therapy. Antibodies are some of the newest blockbuster drugs against different cancers, against autoimmune disease, against other infectious diseases. And of course, you're familiar with antivenom. If you've had a snake bite, you go get a shot of antivenom, that's antibodies against that snake toxin. What those antibodies do is they right away find and neutralize that toxin before it destroys your tissues. Your immune system can make an incredible array of antibodies. In fact, there are a quintillion possible molecules. So a quintillion is one in 18 zeros. There's that many. It's a very large haystack. 
If you want to make antibody as a drug, you have two options. You can give what's called convalescent sera, that's the sera right from a survivor into another person. That's great in an emergency, it's an old technology. The challenge is that people only have so much blood to give and it's quite variable. Some people mount a strong immune response, others not so much. A more precise and better controlled way is to figure out which of those quintillion possible antibodies in different survivors or different vaccinees are the very best. If you can pick your favorite one, two, or three, you can manufacture them in the laboratory as a very clean and pure drug and give them intravenously. There are new formulations where you can try to deliver them faster as a shot or as an inhaler. So we have to find the very best one, two, or three among a quintillion possibilities. A couple of needles and a very large haystack. There have been a lot of companies in academic labs and government labs racing to answer this question over the last year and a half. There are at least, at least 70 different companies and probably more in the marketplace that have each gone about to try to discover these antibodies and mobilize them as competing products. Well, here's the challenge. If there are only a, so many dollars you can invest in clinical trials and so many clinical trial beds, how do you know which of those competing therapies are the ones you want to invest your efforts in evaluating? How do you know which are best? Because every group will have done a different kind of experiment to evaluate them, and every group is advocating for their own. How can you actually compare them side by side in a very fair way? To do precisely that, we were asked to launch a global consortium at the outset of this outbreak. We call it the Coronavirus Immunotherapeutic Consortium, and it was launched with shared funding between the Gates Foundation, NIH, and the GHR Foundation. And the goal of this consortium, COVID, was a global collaboration. Anybody that was making an antibody product or anybody that was an expert in evaluating antibodies and how they worked would work together to evaluate all these competing therapeutics side by side in the level playing field under multiple criteria to figure out which antibodies were best. We needed to understand for this new virus, what were the criteria by which we would judge how we define best, what makes them best, can we do even better than that? And if we want to avoid mutagenic escape, we want to deliver more than one, called a cocktail. You want to have antibodies that hit more than one site at the same time. So the virus can't, has to come up with twice as many mutations to try to escape it. And that makes it less likely that you would engender escape, more likely you would have a durable therapeutic. And if what we need is a cocktail of different antibodies put together, you know, there's a good chance the best cocktail we could come up with might be one antibody from Washington, another antibody from Tokyo, and we would never know until they're in the same room together. So how are we going to do this? How do we unite 70 competing companies and a whole number of academic and government labs to work together when there is a profit motive to outcompete each other and launch that project forward. We know that in a global pandemic, we need a global solution. We know that to deliver therapeutics to impoverished people and people around the world, we need to find something that we can deliver this very potent and very safe that we can manufacture at low cost. We need to find a framework by which we can build the broad data set that we need, a framework by which we can encourage all these competitors to work together a framework that allows them to contribute by protecting their intellectual property and alleviating any concerns they may have about loss of value of their product by somebody else figuring out it's not as good as they hoped. How do you do that? We built upon a similar consortium that we had been building over the last few years for Ebola virus and other emerging pandemic viruses. We used that as a framework and worked really hard to build a research and legal structure that would protect participants' intellectual property, allow them to contribute their competing molecules, recruit academics or experts in different ways of analyzing antibodies to compare everything side by side and level playing field, and understand which were the most effective therapeutics to mobilize forward and deliver to everybody. We worked really hard, and you see early in the spring, it was really hard to work with all these different groups to figure out what were their concerns, how do we make the study work for them, recruit partners. But then the number of submissions started to increase. And right now we have nearly 400 molecules in this consortium. 
all of the different antibodies that we're evaluating as therapy come from a variety of sources, and that's the beauty of it. Every one of these competing companies or competing laboratories has used a different strategy to find their candidate therapeutics. Some looked at survivors of the current outbreak. Others looked at survivors of the related SARS-CoV-1 20 years ago, and some of these people have since been vaccinated with the new virus. So they boosted their antibody responses. We had other companies that did a completely computational in silico search to try to design something. Others immunized mice populated with human genes. Some other groups went with designing different multivalent structures to improve binding. We also have novel structures and nanobodies. So we're evaluating all kinds of different ways of discovering antibodies at the same time, the results that they come up with, and different frameworks that we could use as therapeutics. And for each one of these competing molecules, we're evaluating them side by side by how well they bind to that surface spike on the virus, their binding, how they compete with each other, because we need ones that will work well together to make a cocktail, how well they can neutralize viral infection in different viruses and different sequences and different ways of measuring neutralization, how well the base of that antibody called the FC can recruit immune function to clear pathogen and affected cells. We're looking at the structures, the molecular structures of how these surfaces fit together where immune system attacks pathogen and what, it, what a successful response looks like versus an unsuccessful response. We're looking at which of these antibodies can be escaped by mutations, which of them protect living things and more. And the beauty of this large study is that no single one of these contributing groups can do all of this work by themselves. But we brought in experts at giving them analysis back so they get a bigger data package on their candidate product while we have the opportunity to survey things side by side. The other important aspect of the study is that all of these molecules are blinded. They are only known as a code name. That makes the study very fair. We're just choosing based on the data which ones are best and why. And because all the molecules are blinded, that means that we can make all this data immediately available in a publicly accessible database for all SARS-CoV-2 researchers around the world. They can just look at the data as we have it and as it gets uploaded and download it into their own Excel spreadsheet and use for their own analysis to make better vaccines and better treatments from their own labs. The contributors are two-thirds industry about one th a quarter academics and a few government laboratories. And they come from four different continents, all these different companies. And among, among the companies, about 8% are the large multinational corporations. So the household names you've read in the news, those molecules that you have read in the news, those are in this study as well. But we also have a lot of small companies and startup companies. And you can see the advantage to them that if you are a tiny startup biotech and you think you have a good candidate drug, you may not be able to afford to run your own clinical trial. You certainly can't afford the whole array of different experiments that we're doing. But if you've got a good molecule, you want it to have a fair chance. And so this gives all these small companies an opportunity to have their molecules evaluated in a level playing field and advanced to treatment. But from our standpoint, this is what it looks like. 370 of the world's competing therapeutics all side by side on a level playing field, each known by their code name as we evaluate them one by one and understand which work best and why. And to show you what that looks like in this laboratory right here, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to turn it over to my program manager, Dr. Sharon Schindel, who has been leading and propelling this coronavirus immunotherapeutic story since the beginning. Sharon? Thanks, Erica. Um, so I'm standing here today with some of the collection of COVID antibodies. Um, as Erica mentioned, we have about 370 right now. And what I'm doing right now is um, all of these antibodies have come to LJI first, where they have their own names, and then I assign a code name to them. I am unblinded, and the program officer from the funding bodies is also unblinded. But Erica is blinded. She has no idea which one of these antibodies is which. One of these might have come from a large corporation with 10,000 employees. Some of them might have come from uh, uh, companies that have only 10 employees. They're all equal footing because they're all blinded. Um, so this box here has some stocks. Um, and then um, they go out to one of seven partner labs. And these partner labs are spread out all over the country. And one of them is in Canada. They are the ones that perform the standardized assays that Erica mentioned. Um, so today I'm getting ready some shipments that will go out 
uh, to these partner labs. And I have um, two antibodies that just arrived this morning. So um, one of the first things I like to do is when they, when they come out is um, to check the concentration of the antibody, because again, they may report a certain antibody uh, concentration, how much antibody is in the solution, but we wanna make sure that everything is standardized. So we measure everything here again at La Jolla Institute. Um, so we have you know, a little machine here that, that makes it very simple. Um, and this will give me a readout as to how much antibody is in this sample. So in this reading, it, uh, it comes out pretty close to what they told us. It has four milligrams. If I had a milliliter of antibody of a solution, I would have four milligrams of antibody. So once we know that each one of these antibodies, then we get box sets that go out to the different labs. So right now I have um, this set here is probably about a third of the antibodies. This partner hasn't received a few antibodies for a little while. And then over here, I have parts of sets over here. Um, so these will all get sent out um, for analysis. And then we have the COVID database that is being developed by Bjorn Peters team here at LJI. Um, that, that will serve as a repository. So all these antibodies go out and then we get data back. And from those data, we can analyze how these antibodies function and which ones we think might perform well and which ones we might advance to second generation therapeutic cocktail. So um, this is sort of the bones of the, of the COVID. It's a, it's a lot of blinding, it's a lot of aliquoting, it's a lot of shipping, but it is necessary in order to get standardized uh, data back that we can make a true apples to apples comparison. Okay, I'll send it back to you, Erica. Thanks. So the antibodies come here and one of the jobs of LJI in leadership of this study was to figure out how to form it, figure out how to contract it, figure out how to make it happen, bring in the partners. We're also gathering some of the data as well. So what happened is that Sharon said, all the samples come here, they're all blinded, that protects their intellectual property. And actually those companies have a benefit. They can have all of that data back they can use for their own investigational new drug filing. So there's, there's a benefit to them for participating. All because we have the opportunity to compare everybody's competing drugs side by side, that is being used as an independent confirmation of what will be evaluated in different clinical trials. So we ship it out for different functional experiments. The data comes in together into the database. Now, if we look in the database, which is available right now on our website, you can go look at it, covic.lgi.org. It looks like this. From each one of those candidates, we can evaluate, we have measured of its ability to neutralize. Those are all the little blue dots. We are separating neutralization by its footprint on spike. We can look at its ability to recruit immune protective functions and we can look at its structure and where it footprint. So for example, this is sample 96 in the study and this is one of our standouts. This is one, a molecule we're very, very excited about. It has a potent neutralization. It's one of the best in footprint number five and we can see exactly where it binds in the surface of spike. Now we had started that study and we were building it and launching it for a virus that hadn't changed yet. And about six months ago, when the variants amplified, we had to pivot the study to now see, in addition, which of these candidate molecules are still appropriate against the emerging variants of concern? Which of these molecules are going to be durable as the virus changes? And so the first data I want to show you is from our partner, Cartera. So Cartera first did an array of competition analysis, meaning if an antibody binds here, does it block the binding of others? Which ones work well together and bind at the same time? So every black line is the degree of competition, and they can map those into seven major groups that hit the RBD, receptor binding domain. We can look at these by their extent of their competition and separate them into where they bind and how much they overlap. So we can make major divisions and divide them into different groups based on whether they bind the receptor binding motif that antibody neutralizes by actually blocking the ability of the virus to attach to the cells, or if they bind the inner face or the outer face of that and we can subdivide those into smaller clusters based on their behavior. And so it winds up being sort of a neighborhood map. So it's a little bit like thinking about New York City, which is divided into different boroughs. And those boroughs are divided into different neighborhoods, and of course there's different streets. And by looking at where this antibody localizes on that surface coronavirus spike, we can predict a lot of things about its behavior. So from that competition analysis, we can make a large grid. 
This is across all the different antibodies in the study. What I'm showing you in this grid is that the molecules compete with each other. If they bind the same site, you can't anchor them on at the same time, it's dark blue. If they don't compete and you can pair them together, it's light blue. And you see the rainbow coloring on the top. These are dividing antibodies into different functional groups where we see how they fit. Okay, what's it look like in the spike itself? Some of the experimental work done for this consortium is in my own lab, looking at the molecular structures of how these antibodies attack the surface spike of coronavirus and what that actually looks like in the molecular interfaces. We have the most powerful microscopes here commercially available. They're 11 feet tall and they shoot an electron beam, 300,000 electron volts down onto the sample so we can see things that used to be submicroscopic. So for example, we can see the surface spike of coronavirus. It's shown here, standing up vertically. And it has a piece of the protein we call the receptor binding domain that lifts up in order for this virus to attach to its receptor. We can look at the footprint that each one of these major groupings makes on the virus. And we can get the images of what it looks like when these different categories of antibodies attach to and target the spike. So the coronavirus spike is in white and gray, and each grouping of, of antibody is colored by its rainbow color, as you saw in the competition grid, where groups one, two, and three bind across the top, four and five are in the outer surface, six and seven are in the inner surface. By looking at the footprint of how the antibody sits down and anchors onto the spike, what surfaces it interacts with, what chemistry it uses, which pinpoint changes might knock it out, we can gather lots of information about how these antibodies behave, which ones are and are not susceptible to the emerging variants of concern. So here's groups one, two, and three in red, orange, and yellow, and they overlap that dotted line of where that virus wants to attach to your human receptors when it, when it uh, infects. These other groups are slipped to another side, and by slipping down the side to a different surface, they anchor to a piece of that molecule that often isn't changing. Because as the virus mutates in samples and tries to get more effective at attaching to a receptor, it makes changes in the, in within those dotted lines. It makes changes in the part that anchors to the receptor. If the antibody can do its job by binding somewhere else, it can avoid those changes. And so across this landscape of the different therapeutics, a contributor or discovered from around the world, we can map them into groupings and see which kinds of antibodies are and are not susceptible to which kinds of mutations. So for example, one of the mutations I'm concerned is this E484K, you might have heard it called EEK. That knocks out this orange grouping of 2B. Those are some of the most potent antibodies, but when that mutation emerged, those were no longer effective. What we're excited about and what we found by gathering a very large number of antibodies together are the ones in the bottom right in turquoise, blue, and purple. Those sites are resistant to the emerging variants of concern. Other work, so all that structural work was done by most of my laboratory, everybody in my laboratory gathered one or two structures and solved them all to build up this database and how Yang Lee coordinated all those structures together. Other work we've done here at LJI to try to characterize their behavior against these variants was neutralization studies done by Catherine Hasty, an instructor here. So Catherine looked at the ability of each one of these antibodies, and you can see in the red group, we have sample 69 and sample 259 and sample 186. The ability that each one of these to inactivate alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, and then 4XM and 5XM are different versions of the virus that emerged in mink. You might remember that Denmark had to call their mink populations. And the virus has emerged in wild mink in the United States. So we want to look at those that are out in the wild and emerging in different agricultural situations. Kate can measure the ability of each one of these antibodies to still inactivate or no longer inactivate against each one of these variants. So for example, if she's colored the block green, that antibody works better against those viruses. If she colors the block yellow to brown, that antibody has lost activity. So you can see the beta and gamma variants have evolved mutations that knock out most of the potent antibodies in those orange groups. But for delta, it has different mutations. So against delta, you can use some of these same therapeutics. What we're excited about are those places that are slipped down the side, away from that receptor binding site that's subject to the mutational sampling. We're interested in these groups five, six, and seven that bind elsewhere because the antibodies in these groups, you can see they're all gray. 
they still anchor and they still neutralize no matter which of these mutations emerge. And of course, there are some other examples that still remain very, very potent with some of the other groups. So these are the candidates that we are selecting from the broad group around the world. We want to mobilize as therapeutics. So that ongoing work right now is we're advancing cocktails now toward treatment and we're doing complete variant analysis. What other variants are emerging and how do they respond to the rest of the 370 molecules in the consortium. We're making this publicly available database and this data analysis in the database is led by Professor Buren Peters and his bioinformatics team and the incredible bioinformatics core at Lohoi Institute that harnesses all of that information about the individuality of an immune response and how we can learn from why some people have gotten sick and others have not. And we're advancing those cocktails for treatment and we're using this information in another way because this looks at which antibodies are the most effective and why. These are the needles in the haystack. We can use this information to figure out how you would make a better vaccine because you'd want a vaccine that's going to elicit antibodies like these incredibly potent and broadly reactive ones. How do you do that? Well, that gets to the second question that we've been trying to address. So is there a safety net? Yes, there's antibody therapeutics and they're getting better all the time. But how do we make an ideal vaccine? Because a vaccine is something you can deliver to millions. Do we have it yet, or can we make it better? And one of the challenges with making the right vaccine is that that surface molecule of coronavirus changes its shape. It begins on the surface of the virus in a compact form. And then it very rapidly wants to spring into a lower energy state, releasing part of it and projecting its inner molecule up taller. When it does that, it changes its shape, it changes its surface chemistry, and the antibodies that could target the purple thing aren't effective against the other thing. And if you show the red and white, after structure, the after spring, the post fusion structure, it will elicit antibodies that only target the wrong shape and not the right shape. That springing is irreversible. It's like a jack in the box where the, the, what you want to target is the closed box. But once the spike springs, which is what it wants to do, it's a very unstable molecule, you'll be showing the wrong shape to the immune system. So you want to show the closed box, a lot of preparations of spike spring into its lower energy state, and you show the immune system the cloud. So you make an immune response against the clown, that's not helpful. A lot of older ideas about how to make a vaccine involve taking a virus and killing it or inactivating it. The trouble is that those chemical inactivation processes spring that spike into its lower energy state. So on the surface of the virus, what you want to show to the immune system is shown here in light blue. It's called prefusion. It's that condensed closed box. But the chemical inactivation process in making a number of vaccines springs it into the wrong shape, the brown one, the tall, thin shape. And there's a right and there's a wrong. So you have to be clever in how you design your vaccine to make sure that you're showing the right face on the wanted poster of the immune system. Given that the molecule is so unstable, how do you do that? Well, the mRNA vaccines have taken a different tack. Instead of growing whole virus and inactivating it, they've tried to make just the gene for that protein and have your own cells make it so it hasn't need to be see chemical inactivation in any way. They use just the one gene that expresses the spike. They package it in a little lipid particle and they've done another little bit of engineering. They've added two little tiny molecular changes inside that spike that kink the structure, each one of those induces a, a, a mutation called proline, P, so it's called 2P, induces a little kink to try to help keep the molecule closed. And so if you got the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine, you got a 2P molecule in your vaccine. So it was a good start, but it's still got some problems. You can't make a lot of that version of spike. Each copy of nucleic acid doesn't make as many copies of the molecule to show the immune system. It's also still heterogeneous. It still wants to spring to different shapes. It doesn't gather into its right three-part bundle. And I think one of those prolines is actually a bad idea because it removes some beneficial um, structure that was there before called the salt bridge. The next idea in the field was to add four more of those molecules, so six prolines called hexapro, which is if two are good, maybe six is better. Maybe this would help keep that jack-in-the-box inside its box. But the trouble with that molecule is it still falls apart and requires something else to bind it together, it requires some foreign piece of molecule as a clamp. The other thing is because it still has that 
detrimental proline, its internal structure isn't quite right. And so the way it's processed and presented, it hasn't put the right sugar coating on it. So your immune system isn't quite getting the right face in the wanted poster. What the clamp should be is another problem. You may have read in the news that an Australian vaccine couldn't be used because the design of it used a small piece of HIV as the clamp. It by itself was harmless. It wasn't going to give you HIV, but it did show your immune system that thing. And so you made antibodies that reacted with that clamp. And those antibodies would give you a false positive on an HIV test. So that wasn't going to work. So the question is, can we do better? Can we do something better than that two-piece structure that we've had? So my lab worked on this for about a year, and we've come up with a third generation spike. We took out the proline we think was bad. We added a flexible linker to prevent separation, and we added a small internal staple to hold the structure together down to its core. We call that molecule V-flip. V is the Roman numeral five, it's got five prolines. FL, it's, we've added a flexible linker to tie that clown down in its box. And IP, an interprotomer disulfide bond, we've introduced a small molecular staple. And we did lots of iterations and evaluated lots of different places, and we found this one the best. And this is the structure seen in our 11 foot tall microscopes of exactly what that molecule looks like. And so we can see the staple that we introduced, and you can see how we built back in that salt bridge, return it to the natural wild type. And so this is what that molecule looks like. This is now the, the cryo electron microscopy picture of that V flip spike where the three parts that come together, we've artificially colored pink, green, and blue. And all of the carbohydrates attached to it were coloring in gold. And our collaborator in the Netherlands has released and analyzed these structures. So that V flip plus the spike gives us much better yield and a much more stable molecule. In fact, we can leave that protein at room temperature in a drawer for a month and it's still in really good condition. That's incredible. It stays in its right shape. It has put on the correct carbohydrates that resemble those in the surface of the virus. And it's a much better shaped molecule. And so what happens, we try to use it as a vaccine. Is it a better vaccine? Well, there are lots of different ways to evaluate what happens when you try to use something as a vaccine. The first and the simplest test you might do is to see, well, does it elicit any antibodies at all? Does it elicit antibodies that will anchor to that protein? Does it elicit just total antibody? And the answer is, if you evaluate 2P and Hexapro and the new V-flip, then you look about a month after immunization, they all give antibody, that's good. Maybe the 2P gave a little bit more antibody. But the question you wanna ask is not, does it give any antibody at all, but does it give good antibody? Does it give the needles in the haystack? Does it give the kind of antibody that's gonna be protected and the kind of antibody that's going to be protected, it's what's called neutralizing antibody. Antibody that can actually inactivate the virus. So if you want to compare these three vaccine formulations and look at whether or not they elicit neutralizing antibody, and you look right after, one month after immunization, you see this, where the V-flip gives a little more antibody than Hexapro, which gives a little more ant neutralizing antibody than 2P. So it does give more neutralizing antibody a month after infection, so it's better. But what we really wanted to know was, does that antibody last? And this is the national conversation. Is our immunity waning? Do we need a booster? If we need a booster, are we boosting with the right thing or can we do better in the future? We needed to know if this new immunogen, this new vaccine particle that we made, would give longer lasting antibody. And the only way to know if it gives longer lasting antibody is to wait. And so we sat on our hands and we bit our nails for six months to see what did the antibodies look like six months later. Better yet, it elicits more neutralizing antibody and a more durable neutralizing antibody response than the less stable molecule. So we think we have engineered a better molecule to use as a better next generation vaccine that we can use to keep responding against re-emergence of this virus every year. So all of that work and that engineering was done by postdoc Eduardo Olmedias, working with technician Colin Mann in the lab. All of the work from that large global consortium was done by many. So our funding came from a partnership between the Gates Foundation, NIH, the GHR Foundation, a gift from the Overton family that allowed us 
to immediately pivot to looking at all these different variants. If I had to write a grant to do that variant work, I would have had a year's worth of variants by the time we had the money to actually do the study. And I'd like to thank all of the different partners that are doing all of those experiments on that extremely large panel of molecules. The team that's building the database and analyzing the data, the team in my lab that are solving all of those structures, and all of the different participants that were willing to send their candidate treatment to someone else to evaluate. All of that work is done here. This is the outside of the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. The reason we were able to build this consortium just a few months after moving here is because of the incredible facilities that already existed, that we have the best core facilities with fundamental propelling infrastructure in the Mesa. We have 20 investigators that, although they have their own areas, each analyze that human immune system. And we don't know what the next pandemic is going to be, but we know the human immune system is what is going to respond. And so the research that we put into analyzing what is protection look like? What does an effective immune response look like? How do we create a vaccine that will last a lifetime? These are the same kinds of questions that analyze the same kinds of cells using the same kinds of instruments as analysis of how does the immune system clear plaques in your arteries and heart disease? How does your immune system find and destroy individual cancer cells before they become a tumor? How does the individual immune system give us those differences we see in our own households where different sexes respond differently to different diseases? And why do some people have an asymptomatic infection and others a more severe infection? The ability of the scientists here, whether they're the professors or the researchers or the support staff, and the incredible tools and facilities here to unite and focus together on that human immune system is what are going to lead to the most effective advances against the diseases that affect all of our families. And so I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And I will go back to Mitch. Thank you very much, Erica. That was terrific. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we'll just take two questions and to be respectful of the audience, which really has, has stayed in through this fascinating talk. So the first and most obvious question is about boosters. What are your thoughts about boosters? Who should get them given news that uh, vaccines, particularly Moderna, uh, are rather effective? Well, Pfizer has just published their new data and the recommendation has been that individuals 65 and older and those 16 and older who have particular complications or immune complications do receive a booster in order to ensure that they receive adequate protection. And then with other individuals, we await more data and it's a cost benefit analysis of what um, the extent to which they're exposed. Are they health workers? Are they teachers? Are they in the front lines? Yeah, it seems that uh, uh, Dr. Fauci is a booster of boosters, but there's different opinions out there. There isn't yet a scientific consensus. Very good. So um, I would like, uh, there's a lot of interest out in the audience and in society generally uh, about natural immunity. Um, so how does your, um, how does the immune response differ in uh, fully recovered individuals versus um, those who are vaccinated but never exposed? And what about the hybrid? In other words, there are vaccine mandates even for infected people. And, and why is that if, uh, if you have reasonable immunity after infection? Well, the data behind it is this, that the immune response is really quite individual. There is a, a, a large variation in magnitude between people and how they have responded to disease. Some have a strong, longer lasting response, others do not. If you have been naturally infected, you will make responses against other molecules. If you've been vaccinated, you'll get responses against spike. But that vaccine mediated protection has a key benefit if you hadn't had to be sick and expose yourself to the possibility of long COVID. And also the, the most compelling data here are that people that have been naturally infected and survived and subsequently vaccinated can have antibody responses that are extraordinary. And so that vaccine boost gives them a very, very strong level of protection. Great. Uh, well, I think we can do two more if the audience, uh, you answered in a very pithy uh, and complete way. Um, what metrics are generally used to measure an individual's uh, strength uh, with uh, the tests that are now available? Yeah, a variety of different things. So in the laboratory, you could measure total antibody, you could measure neutralizing antibody, you could measure level of CD4 T cells, you can measure level of CD8 T cells. 
Now that's not something you can do at home. At home tests tend to measure presence and absence of total antibody. They don't tell you what kind of antibody, they don't really tell you if the antibody can neutralize, and they're quite variable. There's little standardization across all of those at home tests. So the at home test is kind of a yes, no of an immune response it doesn't really evaluate protected or not protected. And so if you look, for example, at Sharon and that array of different antibodies she's looking at in that study, she can see all the different variations and flavors by which the immune system can operate and what precisely in there gives the best effective protection. And that's not something you can get from an at-home test. Right. So um, you pulled a large team together for COVID. Um, are some questions too big for one lab to answer? Is team science the future? And um, if we emphasize team science too much, is something lost? There's a place for both kinds of science. There, we, we have a motto in our lab, which is actually an African proverb. If you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. Our experience in trying to untangle large problems is that if you can build a team of different tools and different minds and different ways of approaching the problem, you get a better, more complete answer. If you're working alone and you have limited tools, you tend to address the same questions you've always had. You have a hammer, you're looking for a nail. You keep looking for nails. If you can build a larger toolkit, you can understand what aspects of protection you may not have considered before. So when Sharon and I built the very large study for Ebola, we were able to see because we had all of the researchers working together and we had all of the broad array of samples, we had more tools than anyone had ever applied to the problem, that a lot of the protection was brought about by the ability of the immune system to clear and control the virus, which wasn't something that had been considered before. We were able to find one-off individual examples that might have been ignored if a lab just had one of them by themselves, but when you put them together, you can get a meaningful group and better analyze that data. Now, Sharon's actually been eyeball deep in all of this data for coronavirus. So Sharon, what is your experience on, on consortium size science versus single lab science? Having seen both, uh, both in operation, both singly and consortium wise, um, the Ebola consortium demonstrated that you could still produce your own findings and be part of a consortium and I, I think that that's what's happening with the with the COVID as well, is that we are providing um, data for the contributors that they would not otherwise been able to generate themselves. So they're able to get a fuller picture of what their antibody does, both um, for their individual antibody and where that antibody falls in the landscape of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. Great. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sharon, and uh, thank you, Erica, for a wonderful talk, and Sharon for a wonderful demonstration of what uh, COVID is doing uh, and what's out there in terms of new, uh, new therapeutic antibodies and new uh, structures that can be used for vaccination. Very stimulating. Uh, sadly, um, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 are still with us. But I, I want to thank all of you for your interest, uh, for attending this event, and for listening and for your excellent questions. So on the next slide, you will see um, a, a way to get more information, uh, to contact us, to support us. And also, um, if you have a question, a burning question that wasn't answered, please contact us and we'll, we'll try to answer it as best as we can, given that the knowledge we have in this rapidly evolving situation. Once again, thank you all for attending and take care. Bye-bye.